blessed and highly favored. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, especially at such short notice. We're just uh, happy at intellectualradio.com to have someone of your stature here. Why don't you tell uh, our listening audience who you are and a little bit about yourself? Okay, what would you like to know? Everything that you want to tell us. Uh, you want you want the PR piece? Yeah, we want the real piece. We want the, the real <laughs> Pamela. Okay, I'm a wonderful woman of God, first of all. Amen. I thank God for all the blessings that he's bestowed upon me. I'm honored that the creator, my emancipator, my liberator, Jesus Christ, saw fit that I could be blessed yes, ma'am. with so many blessings. Preach, preach. <laughs> I don't know if you call it preaching or whatever. I just call it being ce- celebrating what God has done in my life. Oh, that's um, so from my PR piece, I am a Hall of Famer in women's basketball. I am the only female in women's basketball history that has won on every single level. Uh, in reference to basketball, if I wanted to wear rings or championships, I could wear a ring on every finger. Oh, that is wonderful. I have two state championships in Flint, Michigan, with a standing record of 75-0 and at Flint Northern High School, oh, back-to-back Lord, state championships. I went on to the University of Southern California, played with Cheryl Miller and Cynthia Cooper and with my identical twin sister, Paula McGee. There's some people have saying one of the best women's basketball teams in the history of the game at USC where we won back-to-back national oh, championships. Yeah. We, we remember that. That was the a great, first, great. Uh, kind of the when we talk about the big three, we were the, original, were the original big yes. three. Yes. Pamela and Paula McGee and Cheryl Miller. That was the original big three. Oh yeah, we remember that well and we remember you in the 1984 Olympics. You, you, you all just dominated. And then I went on to uh, play uh, with the uh, Pan American team, won a world championship, went to the World University Games, won a gold medal and then won in the 84 Olympics, won a gold medal, and then had a, t- uh, a career, a very illustrious career in Europe where we have uh, played with Cynthia Cooper and won a European team in Italy. We won the Ronchetti Cup, the European Championship. Okay. Played in Spain, won a Spanish World Championship, wow. then went on to Brazil, won a, two Brazilian World Championships, and then finished my uh, collegiate or coaching career and won a WNBA World Championship being assistant coach with Bill Lambeer taking a team from worst to first to winning a 2003 World Championship in the WNBA which makes me one of the elite women to win at every level. Oh, that is wonderful. That was the Detroit Shock? Yes, the okay, Detroit great. Shock. And my, my only disappointment is that no one got to see you play in the WNBA because they would have been just astonished at that. Well, and I played uh, two year, one year with the Sacramento Monarchs and one year with the Los Angeles Sparks. Oh, okay. In so, the inaugural year. And okay. I was drafted number two in the first WNBA inaugural draft. Oh, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. Are you still involved in basketball today? Well, we know about your son, Javelle, who plays oh, for the right. Denver I'm sorry. Nuggets. I forgot about that. Yeah. We're the first WNBA mom to have a son drafted in the NBA. Wow, you just make history everywhere you go, That's don't you? That's what we do. Oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> we say the Kennedys do politics, the McGee's, we do basketball. Oh, wow. And we do it well. Wow, how's he doing, by the way? You know, he's doing extremely well. You know, they went to the first round. We were expecting him to go further in the West, but I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, he's uh, number 34, the big man in the middle, none, none other than the evolutionary big man, yeah. JaVale McGee in the middle, number 34 well, for the Denver Nuggets. Wonderful player, and, and from what all I see doing the interviews and, and doing stories on him, he's a really remarkable young man, a very humble spirit, and I wonder where he gets that from. You know, and he gets his hops from his mother, too. I know that. <laughs> I, I recall watching a few games, and I would see you in the stands, and before they identify who you were, I said, that looks like Pamela McGee, but... I'm not mistaken. My son said, Dad, no, that's not her. I said, yeah, that's Pamela McGee because I had a little crush on you back in the day. I must say that. Yeah, so uh, I'm so happy. That that's called there. that Amazonian discombobulation. Oh, yeah. She's, she's <laughs> using these old big words on me. I'm going to have to get my dictionary out and, and look those up. That yeah. is wonderful. And he is. He is a wonderful young man. I am a very proud mom. And I always tell him, I said, no, you're in the NBA and all that, but act like you got some home training. Oh, and he does. He does. He carries it well. You, now, you, you might embarrass yourself, but don't embarrass your mama. All right, yeah, because uh, mama knows best. And I'm one of them old school mamas. Uh-oh, are you? That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. Was he always inclined to play ball, or, or was that just natural? Or was that an evolution, or did you kind of push him into it? or? Well, you know, being a being a professional athlete and then having a son coming in your footsteps, there's always some different dynamics that you have to deal with. He started playing ball at nine, and, you know, of course, I was the only mother in the gym. I was the only female in the gym. 
And of course, he was huge at nine. And so all of the, the fathers were saying, you know, you need to put him in soccer. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I used to always say, hey, chill out because I know I got a seven footer. You might have one. Yeah, but you, you know that for sure. <laughs> yeah, I said, that one right there, that's a seven footer. Well, how, how tall are you, Pamela? I'm 6'2. Six 6'2, two. Six two, okay. And his dad is 6'9. Oh, wow. Well, that explains it all. What, what brings you to the Chicago area? Well, you know, um, intellectual radio is a new phenomenon. Uh, Earl Winfrey and I did some business back in the day. We did okay. a comedy show called No Restrictions. Okay. okay. So um, we're always looking f for investment opportunities. We're always looking for opportunities to take small businesses to the next level. You know, um, because my son has been has been beneficial in what he's trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, he just signed a new deal for four years for forty four million. Oh, wow, that is wonderful. God is good all the time. All the time, yes, God indeed. is good. Yes, indeed. And so we're always looking at promising entrepreneurs. Uh, Earl Winfrey and I have been friends for a long time, okay. and we did some projects back in the day. We did. We used to produce a show called. No restrictions. It no was a comedy oh, show. Okay. Yeah. And so we were in, I was in Chicago, you know, doing some business opportunities and I looked at intellectual radio and I think it's a, a ideal. It is a great, great And so idea. I'm trying to position intellectual radio. I think it should be global. I agree. I agree. I, I think uh, with Earl at the head and, and all the people we have involved in it, it creates a great uh, environment and a great forum for intellectual talk and talk about the community and talk about things that right. we as African Americans And now, and now I'm trying to talk uh, Mr. Winfrey into like some real numbers. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, Mr. Winfrey, we want you to get with her and get those real numbers down so we can make them tangible. You know, you know, it's like, uh, we're talking real numbers where I'm trying to take it global. You gotta get, get catch the vision, That's son. Right. Catch That's the right. vision. I think he's gonna catch that vision because I, <laughs> I have a feeling that you're very persuasive. And not only am I persuasive, I'm about you know, I think that, you know, first of all, I'm always intrigued and, you know, as an African-American female, I'm always intrigued by positive African-American brothers. I like to invest in brothers that's doing the right thing. That's, that's good. I that's like to wonderful. invest in brothers that have a vision. And then um, I think that God always gives you a vision, but he also gives you the provision. That is true. And so um, I just like intellectual radio. You know, we next want to take intellectual radio to Los Angeles. Oh, and that'll be wonderful. Intellectual radio Atlanta. Okay, great. And so those are some, um, some there huge is markets. A, yeah, there is a strategic plan in place. And so uh, we just feel like this opportunity, you know, and also there has to be a marketplace for small business entrepreneurs of color. That's true. To have a place to have a voice, That's to have exactly. a place to expand what God has already given them. And fortunately, God has now given me the position that where I have private investors, I have a private banker, and that now um, I try to explain to people, you know, once my son signed this deal for $44 million, I explained to them. People said, well, why are you still out here grinding? I said, because you don't get it. Yeah. I serve a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, yeah, he can open up the door. God had already said it's time to take the land. So I said, since I serve a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I serve the God of Diane McGee, Pamela McGee, JaVale McGee the first, JaVale McGee the second, oh, JaVale yeah. McGee the third, and right. ja JaVale McGee the fourth. That is wonderful. So I'm always negotiating contracts in a male dominant field and I always say I need to know what the taxable income is because you're uh, you're affecting my grandkids trust fund. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Let's build that legacy. Let's keep yeah, it going definitely. because that's, that's and, what the and other half does. And we all as African Americans, I just tell my son and I tell my daughter and I tell my, I will tell, thank God we don't have any grandkids, but I tell my, my son, I said, you're supposed to take it to the next level. That's exactly right. They always say, Ma, I got here because I was riding your coattail. I said, son, that you got here because you put in some work. You put in the work and, and dedication. And because I set the standard, you're supposed to take it to the next level. Exactly. I because you knew who that. your mother is. That's and right. I demanded that you take it to the next level. Well, I can tell. I can tell you, you you put in the work and you've instilled that in your son as well. And that's very important. And not only that, I make sure that he has a work ethic. That's important. Because he puts in work because I'm, I told him that don't get it twisted. You might have signed a deal for $44 million, but your grandmama was poor. Yeah. Your grandmama cleaned oh, yeah. toilets for a dollar twenty-five an hour, okay. so you need to take it to the next level because Diane McGee cleaned toilets for a dollar twenty-five an hour, so that all of her kids—my sister has a PhD, my other sister has a master's—we're oh, all degree, so that we graduated from prestigious university that's one of the most private in universities in the country, Sum Laude University of Southern California oh, yeah. in economics and that finance. Is, that is wonderful. So you know about the dollar. I know about economic empowerment and capital okay, and what it, what we're supposed to do with it okay, because God great. is going to hold us accountable what we do with his blessings. Now, are you, as, as your family, you just mentioned your sisters, 
with their degrees and advanced degrees. Are you all working together in some of your ventures? Yeah, most of the time. You know, I and sometimes we're not because I have to set a standard for my family. Sure. You know, there's always accountability for God. We have to also make decisions that are conducive to where we need to go. Sure. You know, my son, you know, just signed a $44 million contract, but I still drive a 2007 S550 that's paid for. Okay, that's a blessing. No, I'm talking about we need to make decisions as sure. African Americans that it ain't always about driving, buying a $10,000 purse and driving a new sure. car every two years. It's about establishing capital, buying some land. Yeah, because land's going to take you a lot farther than a car or a watch or a ring. You're right. And having some assets. That's great. Not just having an ass, having some assets. That's right. <laughs> that make right. money. My, my, your money ought to be a slave going to get two more slaves. Right. You're planting those seeds, sowing those seeds. That is great. Are you doing anything in, uh, you're out of uh, L.A. now? I'm out of, uh, I'm bi-coastal. I okay. have, a, a, my home is in a, a Virginia. Okay. Virginia is one of the most affluent areas for African-American women. 40% of all state contracts have to be, it's a state law, have mm -hmm. to be given to minorities. Oh, That's wow. on that is, the Commonwealth of Virginia. That is wonderful. So I have a stake in Virginia, and also we have a place in Los Angeles because my son lives in the, in the uh, Los Angeles, and we just secured a deal with the own network for Millionaire Mama's Boy. Oh, that is great. Tell us about that. Uh, we if, just if got you can. a deal called Millionaire Mama's Boy Own Network. My son has a, a, a entertainment company called Pierre Entertainment Inc. And so we produced a sizzle and Own Network bought it. And we and Sony is, has the distribution rights oh, of okay. a reality show called Millionaire Mama's Millionaire Boy. Millionaire Mama's Boy. When can we expect to see that? Well, you know, we're in production and um, actually that's dependent on the network on when they want to put it out and when they want to release it because they feel like it's such a hot show so they want to make sure that is strategic when they release it. Okay, and that's on. That's the Oprah Winfrey Network. Yes. Oh, Oprah that is Winfrey great. Network. I know she was struggling with viewership early on, but it seems like she's come around. Well, and, and one of the reasons why it is on the Oprah Winfrey Network because Oprah had a co commitment that she didn't want black women arguing with each other. Sure. She didn't want black women, you know, cussing each other out, throwing glasses at each other. She refused to have that on the network. When she saw our our piece and she saw strong African American women raising powerful black men and the black men were coming behind them okay she was so excited about the project the reason why my because we really don't need to do reality tv we're not trying to make you know we're not into it just to make a whole lot of money sure we're not into it that we got to be famous i was into it because my people said we need to see more positive african-american women as images on tv that's great and that's what we do here at intellectual radio as well we want to expose the world to those positive images about, about African-American women as well as African-Americans as a whole and we really appreciate you taking the high road and, and putting out positive things because there's so many negative uh, visions of our people on TV as you say throwing glass fighting cursing each other out disagreeing and we really appreciate you taking the stance of making sure that we see positive and entertaining because we can be positive and entertaining in the same thing so I, I, I tip my hat off to you. I want to jump into something real quick. Uh, I can't let you be here and not talk about basketball. Um, we just finished the NBA Finals, uh, which the Miami Heat, Go Heat, uh, finished uh, above the San Antonio Spurs. Were you watching that? Did you get of a chance to, to, to observe? What were your, your, talk, your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, first of all, I think um, we always got to look at the big three. I mean, the big three came in the game and they changed the whole game of reference. And basically, quiet as it's kept, they were power brothers in the game. Individuals explained to me that LeBron James was an employee of the Cav Cleveland Cavaliers. And I explained to them that I think you need to change his, the dynamic. LeBron James changed the game. Mm -hmm. Primarily because LeBron James was not an employee. LeBron James is an independent contractor. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And they said, well, no, because the Cleveland Cav Cavaliers, they sign his check. I said, well, I'm going to prove to you that LeBron James is an independent contractor. Okay. The Cleveland Cavaliers were worth $350 million mm -hmm. when LeBron James was in the city of Cleveland. Correct. Now, the Miami Heat were worth $250,000 when LeBron James was in the Cleveland Cavaliers. Once LeBron James left the Cleveland Cavaliers and went on to Miami, the, the Cleveland franchise was now worth $100 million. So they... they 
was a decline in their... Um, because one yeah. asset moved. Sure. Now, when the asset moved, now the Miami Heat is worth $550 wow. million. Dollars. So, in your opinion, would you consider LeBron James an employee or independent contractor? Independent contractor. When you can move exactly. $250 million by your presence? That says a lot about his presence and his abilities. And, and let me ask you this, since we're on the subject of LeBron James. I know uh, when he decided to make the decision to move from Cleveland to uh, Miami, there was a big hoopla and he had the, the big decision. And do you think um, that all of the up, uprage and uh, him being vilified, was that, was that accurate or do you disagree with the way he was treated or the way that he was portrayed? Well, I, I think that, you know, I use it as an example that for my son to see. You know, sometimes you can see life. LeBron James is one of the best players to ever play the game. I agree. Now, what we also saw was the fact the way the owner treated him after he left. I agree. All he did, just like Leo Ayatoka when he left the Chrysler, mm -hmm. Chrysler to go work for another company. Right. CEOs do it all the time. Exactly. Nobody's in the uproar when a CEO says, I want to go from one company to make two million dollars to another company to make three million dollars. Exactly. Nobody has an uproar when 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 Leah Iotoka goes from Chrysler to GM or whatever. No one has an uproar. Yeah, he's heralded for doing that. Exactly. But because LeBron James made an ish made a decision mm -hmm. and not only in the process of doing the decision, he raised two point five million dollars that he donated to to the Boys and Girls Club. Exactly. There I, was I, an outrage. Yeah, I felt really uh, that that was a disservice to him because had Cleveland wanted to trade him at any time, they would have traded him and there would be no backlash as it was for that young man. And that's why I'm really But what I have happy. an issue with is that, you know, we have a tendency to put these people on pedestals like, like Greek gods and as soon as they're no longer there to serve our purpose, we crucify him exactly. to burn his uniform. It's just totally unacceptable. It was like he had uh, committed murder or something. It was totally it was, unacceptable. And then to, for an owner to say the outlandish things he said. And I, I mean, and I'm yeah. just saying people should be held accountable. I agree. I agree. To say that in the media was, was just totally disrespectful to LeBron James on what he brought to that community. And quiet as his cap, LeBron James was there for, what, five years, five six years. years? And he took them to the championship on his back. On his back. So they, they didn't provide any uh, assistance to him. He didn't have a, a team. And, and, the, and the, the, re, the, the legitimate question is, everybody has to be held accountable. Los Angeles Lakers, to, to their detriment or to their success, they kept Kobe Bryant in Los Angeles. Right. Now, whatever they had to do, whatever they needed to do, they kept Kobe Bryant in Los Angeles. That's true. So if you could not keep LeBron in Cleveland for seven years, five years, or whatever, you had your opportunity. And business is an ebb and a flow. And he has both as an independent contractor, as a businessman, he can make whatever decisions he has to make for his family. Exactly. Do you think he'll, he'll stay in Miami? I know there's been a lot of talk about now that uh, they've won two in a row and the big three are not performing as they had hoped in, in some instances. What, what are your thoughts on that? And I, and I defer to you definitely as a basketball mind because uh, we got a lot of speculation, a lot of folks talking about what he should do, what the Heat should do. What, what are your thoughts on that? I don't see why he would leave Miami. Miami as a state has no taxable income. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that makes sense. Miami, we have two world championships. So Miami has no tax as a state does not have any taxable income. Okay. Tax no state tax in wow, Miami. That is. Wonderful. Have you ever went to South Beach? I've been there, but only for, for all a few I'm minutes. saying is go down to Cleveland and go to South Beach oh, and yeah. then call me. Okay, I will. <laughs> okay. Call Let's me. Yeah. There's two places in basketball. It's either Los Angeles, New York, or Miami. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're the hot topics. I know. Yeah. It's just you know at one point you have to live in these places too. Sure. And Miami is a world by itself, especially for a man. Well, he is married or married or have a yeah. uh, LIP or whatever. But now, Miami is a world by itself. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that my son actually, he's uh, about to go to law school and he really wants to go <laughs> to Miami. Miami, South Beach is just uh, the beaches, the, the atmosphere is multicultural. It's just really hard with no income tax on the state level. Wow. I, I didn't know that. Thank you for, <laughs> for educating me. So, son, if you're listening, uh, maybe Miami is a good choice. Uh, let's jump over and talk about the WNBA. Um, 
I know that you didn't, you were there in, during the upstarts, and we, when we think of you, we think of yourself, your sister, the Cheryl Millers, the uh, Cynthia Coopers, and the uh, Cheryl Swoops of the world. What's the difference between um, what you all did and what the WNBA is looking like now? Well, I mean, to be totally honest with you, I really can't even comment on the WNBA. I mean, unfortunately, you would think I'm a former WNBA play, player. I could say, yeah, I know a lot about the WNBA. I have totally strategically been on the men's side, NBA. Okay. Primarily, it's because I'm straight and heterosexual and I like men. Okay, <laughs> amen. And she's gorgeous, by the way. And I look like a woman. Yes, you do. <laughs> no, that's a joke. That is a runny, that is a joke. No, but honestly, I just don't have time because I'm so strategically watching the, the men's game and I have a couple clients that I represent that's coming out of college and play overseas. Okay. So I just don't have enough time to really focus on the women's game when I've really been strategically watching men's basketball and networking on the men's okay, side. Sure. So just due to my just not enough time, hours in the day and being strategic and keeping my vision where I need to be okay, right now. Understand and looking at where my son needs to be and what's coming out the draft and where his future is, sure. I really haven't had enough time. It, it's enough for me to stay on top of the NBA game and the college game and the draft. Okay, and, sure. and I just really haven't had enough time to really strategically look at the WNBA, okay, to be totally honest. you got a full plate. I really do. What, what do you think about, I uh, just want to flip-flop and go back to uh, Denver, what do you think about uh, George Carl being dismissed after winning Coach of the Year? Uh, if you can comment on that. I think that uh, Kroenke Entertainment, um, Josh Kroenke is a genius on the bat on the team that he has strategically placed together. Uh, Josh Kroenke is the president of Kroenke Entertainment. His father owns Kroenke Entertainment, and they own quite a few teams. I think that J Josh uh, Kroenke is the one that strategically put that young team together. Okay. He is a basketball genius on putting that team together, and in my opinion, they should have went came out the West. The West was wide open this sure, year. Sure, it was. So it was not, although they came out to the first round, that team right there with 57 wins and the, the young guys that they have, mm -hmm. the West was wide open. It was. They I should agree. have gotten past Golden State. Go Mark Jackson had, a, at what, two players and a half? Yeah. But, and beat the, yeah. the Denver Nuggets. They did. And sometimes we have to understand that you know, just like in business, there's an ebb and flow. We all got to remain relevant. We always got to have paradigm shifts. Mm -hmm. And just like anything else, the basketball game has changed. And we as coaches, we as individuals, we as business managers have to make sure that we are, we're relevant and we stay current sure. with the way the game has changed. What well, What's the biggest change? Uh, I was uh, watching ESPN earlier and through the weekend. The biggest talk is not necessarily the championship of the Miami Heat, but it's Doc Rivers. And the L.A. Clippers, Doc Rivers is, uh, I guess, going to sign as the coach of the L.A. Clippers. And a lot of talk is that Kevin Garnett is going to come over with them as well as possibly Paul Pierce. How does that switch the way or the look of the L.A. Clippers and also the look of the way the league is, is uh, switching to having just, you know, big threes and this whole big deal of uh, uh, superstar players on one team? Well, I mean, strategically, we have to have a winning team in Los Angeles. And, or a winning team out of New York. That just has to happen strategically to keep but economics economically to keep the league where it needs to be. Okay. The NBA, the B stands for business. Right. So the NBA is a global entity. And okay. so the largest markets are none other than Los Angeles, uh, New York, and Chicago. Yeah. So those three entities will protect the league in itself okay. because the league has to evolve in order to maintain the, the finances and the substance so that our players can get paid. Sure. So um, if uh, Doc Rivers is trying to move to Los Angeles, that makes a commitment that Boston has made a commitment to rebuild. Sure. Like I explained to you, these are businessmen who say there's an ebb and a flow. Okay. And when we look at the dollars, if they're not going to win a championship, then sometimes they start over and okay. rebuild. So if that's happening, then Doc Rivers understands the writing might be on the wall. So he's trying to strategically place himself in Los Angeles, but Doc is also a winner. And he sure. says, I'm not going to strategically move from a good situation and not make sure that I come into Los Angeles to make sure that I'm going to be able to compete. Okay, so he's surrounding himself possibly with guys that can compete at a high level. and uh, hopefully Well, I mean, I know Doc personally, and just like me, I don't make moves unless I put... I'm one, of, one of the reasons why I'm successful mm -hmm. in basketball, or I was successful in basketball, because I understood that in order to be 
you need a team. And just like um, this is a true story, when Cheryl Miller was coming out of high school, she had committed to UCLA. Oh. And the day before signing, I spent the night over her house. Okay. This is a true story. And I explained to her, I said, look, there's no doubt that you'll be the number one player in the country. You'll probably be, at that time, it was called Parade All-American. You'll probably be a four-time Parade All-American. Okay. You'll probably be player of the year every year you come into the league. But the only problem you're going to have is that you won't ever win nothing. Okay. She said, well, why is that? I said, because you got to come through us, and we number two in the country. Okay. <laughs> and you all, you all were stacked. You all we're were number stacked. two in the country. You all were stacked. So you need to know if you just want to be a superstar or you want to win some hardware, you want to win some championships, you need to come on here and get, on, get a part of the team and build a dynasty. Okay. And I had explained to her that, you know, I'm not really, some, some athletes are very egotistical and they want the light to be around them. Well, since I've always had a twin sister, I wasn't a, a, it wasn't a big deal for me to share the ball. Okay. You know, I could share the ball. So I said, now, when you come on, on the picture, it might be my game on Monday, your, your light on Tuesday, Paula's light on Wednesday. But when this is all over, we're going to create a dynasty. So okay. what you going to do? Being part of a, a tradition and a dynasty, you know, standalones tend to get forgotten. Dynasty exactly, and, and that was all she wrote. That was the missing key, and then we had back-to-back -back national championships. Right. Yeah, you guys were wonderful. And we put USC on the map. You sure did. Um, you seem to have a real drive, and, and part of that, from your athletic side, how do you transcend that to your business side? Because I'm listening to you, man, and I'm motivated, and, and I'm, <laughs> I'm so impressed with your business mind. More, not as uh, I won't say more important, impressed than with basketball. Cause I told you I had a crush on you back in the day, but I'm equally as impressed. I keep with telling you that's the Amazonian discombobulation. Okay, when when we take a break or we get off there, I'm gonna look that up. Then I can answer that question. But until that time, tell us what, um, how do you you transfer that that athletic drive, or is that something you always had and you just moved it into the the business arena now? Well, personally, I don't know. I think I, maybe I've always had it. I think it got tweaked. Um, one of the issues that I think that I'm a little bit different than most females is the fact that I didn't grow up with women. I grew up with guys. Okay. Um, I was always tall, and I had the only hoop in the, in the yard, in the backyard. So okay. it would be about 20 guys in my backyard. And my, my rule of thumb was, look, if I don't play, it's my basketball hoop and my ball. If I don't play, don't nobody play. Mm -hmm. And you probably took them to school, didn't you? And so, and eventually, and then after... I would go to the park, they would always tell me, you can't play because you're a female. And i say, what? I can't play because I'm a female. And I would just say, I got next. Okay. And so, and then I had to prove myself. And eventually I got so good that I could run the court. And everybody in the court knew me. Okay. So I could hold my own against men. So what I find, and I try to explain to mothers that you should all should have your, your daughters play sports. Because for me, when I'm negotiating, when I'm in the arena, when I'm in the business arena, mm -hmm. I never go into an arena and say, well, all these men are in here. I go into an arena saying, look, it's money on the table and it ought to be mine. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, do you keep in contact with any of your former teammates, like Cheryl or any of them? Oh, most definitely. Cynthia Cooper just got hired at USC as the head coach. Oh, for this basketball wonderful. Program. That is great. I'm a Cynthia Cooper fan. Most definitely. Also, uh, here in uh, Illinois, in Chicago, Cheryl Swoops is now the uh, head coach of the Loyola Ramblers. Oh, okay. Uh, they announced that a few months ago. Is back. that like the college? That's team? college, yeah. That's a uh, Division One, I, I believe. Oh, okay. Uh, and we, we need all the help we can get. Uh, you know, Chicago's been known for winners, but lately we, we haven't had very many winners. So we have a, a network from the USC network from that championship team. We all flew in to celebrate Cynthia getting her being the head coach at USC, and we still we set up a, a alumni program for athletes that's coming through the University of Southern, Southern California, female athletes, so we try to set up a after basketball network where all of the graduates, now we try to put them in places to be strategic after basketball, we oh. have a network. Oh, for that them. is wonderful, that is great, and that is well needed. You're in the uh, Hall of Fame, the Basketball Hall of Fame, when did you get inducted? I think, now no, no, don't get me quoted, it was either 2012, or 2011. I think I was inducted into 2011. Okay. Now I'm just telling you, I don't really keep up with that sure. stuff, even though I'm proud of it. But I always consider that there's another mountain. Okay. And I've never really been into individual awards, even though I'm thankful and I'm blessed. Okay. I just have never really been into it. But I think it was like 2011 or 2012. I was a 2012 Hall of Fame. Oh, that is great, great, wonderful. Let me ask you about coaching. You mentioned that you were coaching. I'm sorry. Which team were you assistant coach on? On the Detroit Shock. The Detroit Shock the un under Bill Lambert. Yes. Um, 
Uh, are you interested in getting back into coaching? Uh, I think you'd be wonderful. You, you're definitely a motivator. You're definitely a spirited person uh, and a spiritual person. I think uh, the WNBA or even the NBA could, could utilize your skills. Well, you know, prophesy, brother. Hey, prophesy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you know and, I, and at this point, um, I do know I have been in the game for a long time, and I am on the men's side. And, and strategically, ironically, I do know a lot more than, a, than most of the men on that bench. I believe you. Realistically. Because the women game, the women's game is a fundamental game, okay. and we, we we play more from a mental standpoint. And women, just being by gender, we're more in tune with details. Okay. I still see guys now. I mean, even my son. I mean, even though he's a great player, I see him as he hasn't even touched the surface on what I think he should be okay. as his mother, as a as a professional athlete. My 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 standards are so high on what I expect and okay. what I want. And um, and then also, I just think if I was an NBA coach, I don't have an ego as a female. Okay. I just want my guys to be successful. And when I coach boys, I have coached at the high school level. Okay. I was an assistant coach at the boys level. Sure. And okay. for some reason, I don't know if it's because black men are accustomed to hearing a strong female, I can get so much more out of my um, my boys than even the coaches. And the reason being is um, I was coaching – at the high school level, and, I, and it was a, uh, a Caucasian head coach. And I explained to him, and I was coaching at, Con Flint, at Country Day in Detroit. Okay. And he was the head coach, and I was the assistant coach. And we had a lot of urban kids who got scholarships to come into these predominantly homogeneous environments. Okay. And, and I explained to him, I said, you cannot coach brothers like you coach the other players. You just can't That's do true. it. I said, you need to understand the cultural element that for black men, basketball is a rite of passage. Yeah, exactly. And you have to allow them to play and make mistakes. Because they don't have anything else. When you come through the hood, you don't have piano, you don't have hockey, exactly. you don't have uh, just other things to do. That's yeah. your rites of passage, and sometimes your rites of passage out of the hood. So they take it extremely personal. And a lot of times their ego is tied into their basketball. Well, I understood that. Okay. And so the head coach says, well, Pam, I don't think what race has to do with it. I said, so he said, okay, Pam. I'm going to give you summer league. I said, Coach, I don't think you want to do that. Because if you give me summer league, I don't know if you'll get you the get guys it back. back. Yeah. So we played the same teams in the summer that we played during the year. In the summer, we blew everybody out by 40. Okay, with you at the head. Yeah. Okay. Now, during the year, we beat everybody by five or six. Okay. What's the difference? Philosophical differences. No, because I'm telling the guys, go do you. Okay. Yeah, they ain't got nothing to stop it. Take him. And I keep feeding it, feeding it, feeding it. And nobody knows strategically what I know as a basketball player. You okay. just couldn't. I didn't want it every single level. I'd have been under the best coaches across the world. Sure. You know, in every country. So the stuff that I know, there's no way you can know. Okay. And plus, I know how to win. I mean, you I'm can, not talking about you're it. You're a winner. You can Google me. Yes. <laughs> I don't have to Google you. I know. Now, those of you who are listening, you can Google. But I, I, I know. I know of her achievements. So... NBA team calls you and say, Miss McGee, we want a coach. We want you to be the first female head coach in the NBA. What do you do? Do you jump at it? Well, I would probably be an assistant coach okay. first. Because I'm, I'm a firm believer in that, too. Anything that grows too fast is usually a weed. Okay. I think everybody has to pay their dues to know what it looks like, to figure out what you have in order to be successful. You kind of got to pay your dues. Okay. You never can just – everybody has to crawl before they walk. But if that opportunity availed itself – I, it would be strategically stupid for me to say no, right. but that hasn't availed itself. But then again, I'm not one of those persons that limits God. I never know what God is going to offer me or That's what right. door is going to open for me. I try to be open to the universe and just be ready, ready and prepared to walk through whatever door that the Creator offers me. Oh, that's great. That's great. We're going to take a quick break so you can sip some water and I can look up that word you were talking about. <laughs> and we'll, we'll be right back. The Amazonian discombobulation. You got it. We're, I can call